So ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna start this meeting now. Um, there's agendas on that table over there. There's um, a dozen donuts, help yourself. Um, Shana, Shana Barnes, our, our colleague, Concert Lodge, is running a little late. She's at a wake over in Randolph, but she is en route uh, with a case of water as well. Uh, of course, I'm Bob Sullivan, Concert Lodge, Moses Rodriguez, Concert Lodge, Wynn Fowler, Concert Lodge. Um, we're joined by Shirley Azak, Wood 7 Counselor, uh, Jack Lally, Wood 6 Counselor, State Representative and former Wood uh, 6 Counselor, Michelle Dubois, uh, former Counselor from Ward 7, Christopher McMillan. Um, and Beauregard. Uh, and, and Beauregard just... And, and Beauregard, Counselor from Ward 5, is here as well, and I'm sure other people will come in. Um, Really, the gist of this meeting tonight, and I want to thank Moses, Shana, and Wynn. Um, two years ago when I was the council president, I thought it was the smart thing to do is to have these quarterly meetings. At that time, it was all local officials, school committee, city council, mayor, and uh, two Brockton reps for Southeastern Regional Vocational. Uh, last year, that, that didn't continue. So with the new, uh, new legislative body that we have, we have really a good core group of, of people on the council this year. Uh, I asked uh, my colleagues, they jumped on board, they said, absolutely, let's do it. Really, the whole gist of these meetings, first of all, is it's never been done before. In the history of Brockton, the four councils at large that serve all seven wards, all 28 precincts, have never collectively had a citywide meeting. So this is kind of historic, and I, and I hope and I know with, with these gentlemen and, and my colleague, uh, Councilor Bonds, we're going to continue. So this is the first of four meetings planned for this year and we will continue to do it next legislative session as well. But really the gist is going to be to, uh, for us as the councilors serving the whole seven wards, 28 precincts, to kind of just talk to you, tell you what we feel is, is going on right now in the city of Brockton. Of course, budget's gonna be huge, charter school is huge, uh, uh, a lawsuit that was filed is gonna be huge. Uh, but really we're here because we serve you. Uh, when we knock on your door, we ask for your vote, it's your vote of confidence. And these two gentlemen, and, and, and Shana and I, uh, really uh, we honor and, and we believe it's a privilege. So um, what we did before, it was a little different setup, but it is taped. So if you do have a question when we get to the Q&A, again, you can ask uh, questions, suggestions, criticisms. This is just an open forum for you, uh, the taxpayer, the residents, the constituents. But if you do want to ask us a question, please come to the microphone because it is being taped for cable. Uh, and with that being said, I'm going to pass it on to my colleagues as well. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm the new kid on the block, uh, seven weeks into being a member of the City Council. Uh, I said last night, and I'll say it tonight, I see some young faces here. So for those of you who don't know, it was my honor to be on the Brockton Police Department for about 25 years, uh, patrolman and sergeant. Then I ran for the school committee. I served 10 years. I served as mayor for four years, from January 92 to January 96, and ironically, many of the same issues now were the ones that rose to the forefront uh, back in those years, particularly city finances, public safety, financing the schools, and now I'm honored to be on the city council. So uh, I guess my particular interest is always public safety, but I will say a couple of words about the budget. It's going to be messy. Uh, the state changed the formula for how they provide state educational aid to the city in terms of low-income children. And without going into all of the nuances, we're going to take a $5.6 million hit. Now that in and of itself might not seem like much, but when you take a $5.6 million hit and you have rising fixed costs, because we have collective bargaining agreements, we have costs associated with maintaining school buildings, it really translates into what I hope won't be but could be catastrophic. So we're all working together. We support the schools. Uh, I think one of the reasons why you see so many counselors here tonight is that we all share the team approach. Now, we're not going to agree on everything. There, there'll be times that Bob may want to do something and for whatever reason I don't agree and vice versa. Moises may be in the same position. But like a family where you can have disagreements, we all pull together because what's best for the city and its residents is really what's important. So having said that, team approach, we want to hold these meetings, we want to hear from you, we think it's the right thing to do. And the other thing is, if there's one thing I hate about politics is people that show up at election time and they want to have a meeting and they want to get to know you. We don't want to do that. We want to be here continuously. We want to be accessible. We want to try to address any concerns. 
and we don't want it to look like, oh sure, here they are again because they're running for re-election. That doesn't cut it with any of us. This is a job. We got hired to do a job in November. And we're going to do that job to the best of our ability. So thank you for the honor of serving in this position. And with that, I'll pass it on to my colleague, uh, Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Wynn. Thank you, Bob. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm glad that we are taking this, uh, this show on the road. Uh, and I'm glad you brought that up, that this is a non-election year for us. And it's an opportunity for us to actually hit the road and see what's going on uh, directly in the neighborhoods. Uh, we are often at the ward councilors' meetings. We're, we're guests at those meetings because we, we tend to sit back and let the ward councilors run their own meetings. But we frankly don't have a great deal of an opportunity to come out and listen to the folks. So I'm glad that we are doing this and we agreed on this. All four of us agreed on this to do this and to take it across the city, not just to do it on one block or one, uh, one school, but to take it across the city and really listen to you, the voters in this city. Because a, a lot of times you get talked to instead of being talked at or, or understanding what's being said from my standpoint, where it might be a little different from your, from your standpoint. So what we want to do is instead of talking to you is talk with you and carry out a conversation with you to find out what can we do to help you and help us make this city a better city for everybody. Uh, the city of Brockton has complex issues and will continue to have complex issues. But it's not a, an issue that's gonna get resolved by the 18 of us at, in city government, the 11 councilors, uh, actually 19 with the mayor, uh, the seven school committee members and the mayor we're not going to be able to resolve the issues of the city. It's impossible. There's 100,000 plus people roaming the streets of the city of Brockton, and we need everybody to kind of buy into keeping Brockton alive and well. So that's one of the reasons why I believe that this is a great thing for the city, that, that we're actually reaching out and doing it in a, in a non-election year so it doesn't sound like we're out here beating the the sidewalks and knocking on doors looking for votes, but we are actually doing this because we want to hear from the taxpayers and the residents of the city. Uh, what's, what my colleagues have said in terms of the budget and some of these other issues that we uh, are going to be looking at and working on going forward are going to be real issues. Uh, we're going to have some tough choices to make very, very soon uh, with, with regards to the schools, and, and it has... Um, a snowball effect in the sense because it's going to affect other things as well. But trust you me, as a resident of this city, I don't want to see us cut anything in terms of programming, but sometimes we're going to have to make the tough choices and cut things that might be uh, viewed as tough choices. So with that, I'm going to pass the microphone back on to uh, Bob. And, and again, bring up whatever you feel that you need to bring up. We might not have the answers for you, but it's it's something that we're going to go research, uh, and perhaps together we can come up with a solution. Because it's not just, it's not just putting your questions out there, but at the same time, put it, put, put out your questions. But if you have some positive suggestions, some things that we can do a little different, please bring it because it's important for us to 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 take your concerns and take it to City Hall and see how we can, you know, I know it's cliche, you know, that we can together work to resolve uh, to resolve the problems in this city. Thank you, Moses. And uh, what, what we're going to do now, that was the introduction, but what we're going to do now is, is how we open up a city council meeting. If you could please stand and salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, so really, uh, what we're going to do tonight is, is we're going to uh, hear from you. And, uh, but with that being said, uh, on the agenda, and again, there are copies over there, um, because this is Ward 7, uh, if Shirley Azak, the, uh, the great Ward 7 counselor, would like to come up here, do, do you want to give an update at all? No, I'm just going to, if any questions do come up regarding Ward 7, I'd be happy to answer. Great. Okay. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, Jack Lally, any, 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 I know you had a ward meeting last night. Do, do you want anything to say anything, Jack? I'll say hi. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, 
Hi, my name is Jack Lally. I'm the city councilor for Ward 6. Um, updates, if any, we've got where we're working on the air area near the old Remova Park, declaring that land surplus so we can put it out to bid for a sports complex, which will have its access off of Route 37, but still, you know, so it doesn't, it doesn't impede on the on the neighborhoods nearby and will keep green space in the area while providing tax dollars for the city. Thank Sweet. you. Thank you, Jack. All right, there you go. Ian Beauregard, Wood 5, do, do you want to say something, Ian? And I do, I do also want to acknowledge um, Jerry Cassidy, former uh, Ward 3 City Council, who is a Democratic nominee, and he will be our new state rep for the 9th Plymouth District if he votes for himself, because there's no Republican. Jerry, you only need one vote, so vote for yourself. <laughs> know about those vote things. Uh, yes, um, first of all, everybody vote next Tuesday. Polls open at 7 till 8 o'clock at night. But um, I just want to announce that that Ward 5 um, meeting will be on March 10th at the East Branch Library, which is located at 54 Kingman Street. And what we're going to be having is a representative from OCPC, which is Old Colony Planning Council, on uh, the study they're doing on Route 28 from Avon to West Bridgewater and the plans and they want everyone's input to uh, improve uh, that uh, road, the sidewalks and the traffic signals. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you Ian. Um, if anybody else, uh, ward councilors come in, by all means on the agenda, they could give an update if they choose to. Next agenda item was uh, school department. I don't know if anybody here is from the schools. I know Superintendent Smith was attempting to make it, but uh, if she comes or if anybody comes to the schools, by all means, we can give them that form. Uh, public safety update. Um, I know we have Steve Hook. Steve, do you want to give any update relative to? Okay. Uh, Bill Healy um, from Brockton Police uh, had another meeting. He is going to be coming over here tonight uh, to give us an update relative to his endeavors. Um, one thing I can tell you, uh, and then we can open it up, um, unanimously on the city council, uh, and our state delegation, and again, we have three state reps and one state senator and um, the school committee. Uh, we were all opposed to the proposed charter school. Uh, a lot of us went and testified at the state level, sent in letters, um, but ultimately, uh, the Commission of Education made a favorable recommendation. Uh, the governor uh, wanted a favorable recommendation, and it did pass uh, the other day favorably. So there will be uh, a charter school uh, in the city of Brockton. It's called New Heights. Uh, and quite honestly, it will have a detrimental financial impact on our Chapter 70 funding uh, from the state. And again, we get our Chapter 70 funds relative to the school side, and then we get our Chapter 90 funds as well. So um, as, as Wynn said, uh, we had a special meeting uh, last Saturday morning. It was called uh, with the President of the Council, Tim Cruz, and the Mayor, Bill Carpenter, and it included the elected officials on the City Council and the School Committee uh, to talk about Governor Baker's proposed budget. And as Councilor Fowell said, I mean, we're, we're looking at a, almost a $6 million deficit uh, right up front, and, and we know that that figure is probably going to grow uh, relative to uh, contract dollar expenses. So we have tough times ahead. Um, a lot of us that have served on the council a long time, and I've been there 11 years, we've seen some good budgets, but mostly in recent years they've been bad budgets relative to tough financial economic times. So um, again, the mayor will be generating his budget. It will be coming to us. I believe uh, Council President Cruz will probably call budget hearings uh, early June, uh, maybe late May, but probably early June. Uh, but you know, don't be naive to the fact that it's going to be really, really tough times. And, uh, and we're going to have to do the best what we can with what we have. Uh, but I think you should feel rest assured that there are some really talented people on the city council with great varying skill sets and backgrounds. I mean, we have a former mayor with us. Uh, we have a former, uh, 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 Moses worked for Jim Harrington when he was mayor. So we have a lot of skill sets that I think are going to be beneficial. Um, but with that being said, unless my colleagues have anything else, and I know Shana will, um, I, I just have one quick thing, and I, I don't know if anyone has explained how the city budget process works. It's different than the state. The mayor will get together, and he will meet with department heads. He'll meet with the chief financial officer, and he submits a budget. The budget is then transmitted to the council. We only have two options. We can adopt an appropriation as presented, or we can reduce it. We can't add to it, and we can't move money. We can't take 
for example, money from this particular department because we think it's overfunded and give it to another department that's underfunded. So we are somewhat limited. However, I would still say that we are checks and balances on making sure that the appropriations are what they should be for a given department and that we do due diligence when the budget document reaches us. But I wish we could add to it. I wish we had the power to do that if we had available funds. But the chief executive calls those shots, and we only have the people who can, again, reduce or approve and not move money around without an appropriation from the mayor. So if the budget comes out and some of you have a lot of angst, which could happen, I just thought it was important for you to understand our role uh, because it is what it is. That's, that's what's going to happen, and we're going to do the very best we can. Well, as I said, we, I, at least I didn't come here to talk to you, uh, at you. We came here to listen to what you have to say. I know that there's some folks that are at least sitting at that table up there that probably have some tax issues. Uh, and, and to go along with what you were saying in terms of the budget, the same applies to the taxes, basically. I know perception has it that the city councilors uh, are the ones who basically increase taxes in the city. We honestly didn't increase taxes. What we do, we take a recommendation from the mayor and his CFO with the presentation that they make and they gave us a scale of increase it by five or increase it by 10. And we pick between five and 10 what the increase is gonna be. So to basically think that the counselors themselves are the only ones that are actually responsible totally for a tax increase in the city is ludicrous. And I want to make sure that it's, uh, it's, it's put out there because, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, you were not on the council yet, but at least uh, you and I voted against the tax increase along with uh, Shirley from Ward 7. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's passed, and it, in a democratic society, we need to do what we need to do to move the city forward. But I just wanted to make sure that it, uh, it's also understood that it's not the city council itself that decides, you know, gets up in the morning and decides that we're gonna go up there and basically increase your taxes. The city, through the mayor, through to the administration, they propose a tax increase and we either vote on it based on what, what their recommendations are. The, the, the limits, they set the limits between, like I said, between five and 10. It's never at zero, because if it's at zero, we would vote for the zero. So let's just keep it clear and understood that it's not the city councils that actually go up there and do uh, increase the taxes, because we set the tax rates, but we set the tax rates with recommendations from the administration. So do you wanna? Yeah, just. And just to follow up on that, there's, there's two important things that I didn't know before I got on the city council. Uh, what, what Moses is talking about is that a, a tax factor has to be adopted by the city council. The factor is determined uh, by the CFO relative to a recommendation, and it's the scale that Moses said. The city of Brockton has a split tax rate, right? We have our commercial, industrial, we have our residential. There are a lot of municipalities in the Commonwealth that actually have a single source of a tax. So when people have called us, and, and many of us have gotten calls and rightfully so people are saying well my taxes went up but yet the factor was actually less than last year's well there's an assessed value right the city's been going in and assessing and reassessing value my, my house went up like 60 grand I mean how do you figure that and I'm, I know a lot of yours probably went up quite a bit um, but again what Moses said is 100% accurate the city council is a legislative body what we're charged to do is determine what the recommended factor should be adopted and then that's going to that's going to contemplate what the rate and the factor will be. So um, with that being said, I know Councilor uh, Bonds came because she dropped off the water. Okay, she's gone again, but she'll be back. Um, with that being said, I think what we can do, we can let Shana speak. Um, does anybody have any questions that would like to come up? Because really that's what it's about. Please come up to the microphone if you could. Hi, my name is Cheryl Lee Hopwood, and I live at 15 Faxon Street with John Drazinskis, and we own property on 15 Faxon Street. And just like everybody else in Brockton, we got a tax increase this year, and we figured out, you know, why it happened. 
but could you please tell us if you know if it's already in the works or if you think it's going to be presented to you in the first half of the year. Are we going to get an increase on the water, sewer, and trash bills also? Is that percentage going to go up also? Because I know it's rated by how many you know uh, feet of water you use. Yeah, you know, we, it's rated we, on the gauge. Yeah. Is that going to go up? Percentage going to go up also for the figuring? Yeah, as of today, the city council uh, hasn't been given any type of uh, request relative to that mm -hmm. that would be a filing that would be made it, it would be on the city council agenda it would be referred to finance committee where we would then have an open discussion but as of right now to the best of my knowledge no we we, we don't have that i'm not saying that it's not going to happen but yeah as of right now none of us are aware Yeah, because we always get we already get hit with the real estate are we going to hit get hit with that other bill too <laughs> going up <laughs> that's what we were wondering y yeah i mean I, okay yeah we don't and that's that's so you the truth. Uh, we don't know. You haven't approached about that. Yet. No, not at all. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Council Bonds. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Give my tardiness. I was. Yeah, we told you read it. You read it. Okay. Awake. Yep. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, being patient. And I don't actually know what was already uh, Talk shared. You. Talked about me. Okay. About Any questions? <laughs> Any questions, clarification issues? Uh, no, I, you know, I, I would um, probably just defer to my colleagues now and, you know, uh, chime in as appropriate if anybody has any questions for me. Um, as one of your four counselors at large, I'm here to answer it. I'm sure that um, when I came in, I heard some things about the tax issue and uh, s explaining some of the tax factor and how that factors in on actual monies that you spend on your taxes and uh, as, a, as it correlates to the tax factor. So um, if there are any questions, I'm just here with my colleagues. So. Thank you, Shada. By all means, please, please come up. John. And there's water. <laughs> water and donuts, that's a good thing. I don't really have a, um, a question, it's just a, um, a comment. And first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I think this is a great idea. <clears throat> you guys having a uh, quarterly meetings, uh, especially in a non-election year, it shows that you're, you're concerned about the citizens and um, you know, having it in different, ven I don't know what the plan is for going forward, but having it in different venues would be a good idea also. So thank you for, uh, thank you so much for this meeting. Um, I just want to make a comment. Uh, as the four of you know, uh, there's a proposed sports complex in Ward 6. And um, this idea was started by uh, former Ward 6 counselor and state representative Michelle Dubois, and now uh, former, uh, I'm sorry, present, Councillor uh, Ward Six, uh, Ward Six Councillor Jack Lally has picked up the ball. When and if this comes before the council, I urge the four of you to support it wholeheartedly. I think it's a great project. Uh, it's not a power plant. It's not a casino. It's a what I call a people-friendly business that the city needs. Thank you. John, just to let you know, North, North Middle School now, uh, then we will do west, we will do south, we will do east. I don't know what the order is going to be, but we're going to hit all the old former junior highs, but middle schools now. Excellent. Thank you. And with regards to the uh, sports complex, uh, I'm happy to announce that we had a real estate committee meeting just a couple days ago, and it passed uh, unanimously uh, in terms of our support to recommend favorably to the entire council and I don't see any reason why it isn't going to go any, any further than that in terms of support. It's something that I be strongly believe in, especially uh, having the type of community that we have with the needs that we have in this community. I don't see any reason why any of our guys and girls would, uh, would uh, oppose that particular project. So you can rest assured that we will continue to push it and see to it that we actually have uh, a nice facility in fruition. I just want to ex explain really quickly. I just want to explain uh, to the residents who sometimes you may not be able to come into some of the committee hearings, real estate or, or some of the other subcommittee hearings. So in the hearing, uh, uh, the treasurer was there, the procurement officer was there, um, the mayor was there, and the city solicitor, he was there as well. And... Oh, and the city planner, they were there, and they provided us with um, uh, the proposal, the initial proposal for three different projects, but this one in particular because you asked about it, um, and, and it, it has everything in there, and it's on there. We had a chance to ask questions, um, and you know, going forward, I, I want to concur with my colleague and just say that it really does look like a really good plan, and I'm sure that you know, my colleagues and I will follow it closely to make sure that this gets done because you know, it is something, it's an idea that's coming to Brockton that's not a predatory industry. It's something that's going to bring families in this 
this is something that'll bring people in, not to bring them in and to have them, you know, have come, leave with their pockets turned out. You know, you'll leave and you'll get something. And I, I think that's what's going to spur on a lot of new growth here in the city and people will see that. So um, I just wanted to mention that about the actual meeting and what happens in, in those subcommittee meetings. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a win-win. I mean, it, it's good for Brockton, it's good for the kids and the, and the adults that are going to be engaged in that. And I, again, kudos to Rep Dubois because she has, again, she was on the city council for 10 years and she was a cheerleader banging the drum on that for quite some time. And I concur with Moses. I don't see anybody on the council objecting to that. Uh, with that being said, anybody else? Uh, oh, Tom Monahan, Ward 2 City Council came here. Thanks for being here, Tom. Hi, my name is Jody Price. I've been a, a resident of Ward 7 for about 25 years and a resident of Ward 6 when I was a kid for probably 20 years before that. Um, so my question has a lot to do with what John was just talking about and Shannon. How do we build on this idea of getting not decadent, what I call decadent businesses in the city? But, cities, but businesses that we can be proud of that will provide a lot of jobs because I'm not an economist, but I do know that if we don't have a good job base in the city, we don't have a good tax base. And I know in Brockton, our, our job base is falling, falling, falling while everyone else around us is, is rising. My other question, and then I probably won't ask any more, is um, my family has sadly been on the forefront of the heroin epidemic in the city for about 10 years. And um, I felt like we were wolves crying in the darkness back then with what we thought was probably going to happen in the city in the area with the heroin epidemic. And it has. And it seems like there's no solution. And to hear, you know, just kind of, well, we'll work with the mayor, we'll do this, we'll do this sort of superficial band-aids for it. I'd like to hear what are some of the solid strategies you have to fighting drugs in the city that affects all of our communities across the city, fighting gang violence, and creating a safe environment so people do want to move into the city, whether we've got a sports complex or not. If we're seen as a crime-ridden city, we're not going to attract people to come. Thank you. If, if I could just address the, um, the first question, I learned actually uh, in the last special election for state representative, I was actually exposed to a lot of different industries that are clamoring to come into the city of Brockton and to provide us with resources and networks that we never had before. And um, I'm hoping to continue those relationships and to, to you know, bring these people in. I actually just mentioned to Rob May the other day about an opportunity that uh, came across my desk that I think might be good for Brockton. I mean, he's going to vet it out and, and you know, take a look at it. But um, again, I, I'm not really into the whole predatory system. I, I, don't, I believe that we've been preyed upon enough as a community and as a city. And it's time for us to start to get over that hump and to be able to start to be self-sufficient. And, and we can be a Foxborough. Foxborough has probably one of the lowest tax bases in the state of Massachusetts. And it's because of the industry that, that they pumped in there with the Patriots Place. We can do that. If we just leverage our, our um, our marketability a lot better. We can do that, and I think we're on the we're on the the goal to start doing that. And um, this particular, like I said, this particular race it opened the eyes of a lot of people who may not have been familiar or, or Brockton may not have been on their radar before. So there are a lot of really good industries that are looking to come in here, um, and definitely you know working with my colleagues and our state delegation to see if we can get that done. And there's no reason, like you said, there's no reason for other people to, to prosper off of some of these things where we can have that. We have some of the infrastructure, we have some of the, the parcel, we have the site, we have the land, we can do it. And um, it, it will take a little bit of time, but I'm, I'm confident to say that I think this was like a light switch turn. This was a turn on uh, to some people to, that they want, they want to invest in Brockton. So um, we can just kind of keep that momentum going. And again, you know, if, if anybody has ideas, I, mean, I, I bring Rob May ideas all the time, and even if, you know, they don't really filter out, but I bring it to him all the time. Just, just, just check it. Just check it out. Um, if it's not something that's going to work, then it's not going to work. But at least we tried. The only failure is not trying, right? So... Um, I just wanted to kind of mention that. So there are people that are looking to come into Brockton for the right reasons, for positive reasons, not money-making ventures, for, for what they can, um, they can contribute to us as a community and as a city. With regard to the, the, the 
the dr uh, the opioid situation, I do know too that um, the a little bit earlier, in one of the, the uh, last sessions, I believe, the state delegate, uh, the legislature, they passed an opioid um, bill. Uh, I can't, I don't know exactly what it is, but maybe um, Representative Dubois can mention it. So, um, in this set, there was a major opioid bill passed last session, but in this session, we we made the trafficking of fentanyl a, a crime. Um, so that will, that's a really dangerous drug that is usually trafficked with heroin. We've recently passed a law that women are going to be no longer sent to Framingham prison when they are um, um, section 35, 35. 35 for <laughs> drug and alcohol addiction. They'll be going to Taunton State Hospital. Um, we're passing a law to allow police stations to accept heroin and drug paraphernalia and drugs without um, arresting the addicts if they come in and they really want to make a genuine um, a step forward in their recovery. And I know that Mayor Carpenter has already um, talked to our delegation and talked to people at the State House about having Brockton be one of the first cities that starts doing that, ex allowing um, people that have drug addiction to bring in their drugs without any risk of arrest. But there's a lot more to be done. The, uh, the other thing, uh, thank you, Representative. The other thing, uh, I sit on the Plymouth County uh, Drug Task Force. The other thing uh, in that bill on the House side is relative to the Chapter 30, uh, the Section 35 warrants. If anybody is aware of what that is, is if your loved one is impacted by drugs or alcohol, you have the ability to go to court. Uh, it's a civil procedure, but you can go to the court uh, to actually have that loved one taken in for, for protection. The problem with uh, under the law right now under, under the 35 is it's only good for 24 hours. So you go to court in the morning, that thing by the end of the day, that thing's gone. You'd have to go back to court. So if they can't find your loved one within that, you got to keep going back, going back, going back. To the wisdom of the House, uh, what they did is they're going to extend that for five days. It's going to be a sunrise to sunset, meaning it's going to be valid when the courts open. So it's really a benefit to anybody that does use that, and it, it is a mechanism that should be used. One other thing, just, just to answer your question, ma'am, relative to businesses coming to Brockton, um, a lot of businesses have come to Brockton, right? Bernardi, Keneally Foods, Crown Linen right around here. Um, you know, we, we are getting businesses, uh, we're also attracting businesses to stay here. W.B. Mason just a few years ago came before us, Leo Meehan, the CEO, they were going to leave Brockton. Um, what we did was we gave them uh, a TIF, tax incremental financing, in order, I think it was $3 million at that time, in order for them to stay here and they are still downtown. Another thing that we did that is a catalyst for development is the city council adopted chapter 40 hour smart growth zoning. Um, whatever your pros or cons are on the Trinity Financial Project downtown, um, I will say that if Brockton hadn't adopted Chapter 40R, that wouldn't come to fruition. Uh, the growth of, of Vincente's Food, the old star market on Pleasant, again, Chapter 40R, that wouldn't have come to fruition. So there are things that the legislative body can do, but again, as Wynn said, we can't earmark funds. We'd love to earmark, you know, a million bucks to fight the opiate epidemic, right? Both legal and illegal drugs that are really, it's an affliction. Right, it's an epidemic, but we don't have the ability to do that as a legislative body. But we can work in conjunction and collaboration with those that do have the financial strings. We can work with Michelle and Jerry and, and Claire Cronin and, and Senator Brady, and we can work with, with uh, Mayor Carpenter. Um, I, I think Brockton's really beneficial by having Wynn Fowell, uh, not because he was a former mayor, I, I kudos to that, I think that's great, but because he was a cop. Mm -hmm. Paul Stadinsky, a cop. I mean, we are having some skill sets on the city council that have not been there before. Paul would be here tonight, but he's having a Ward 4 council meeting uh, at 7 o'clock down at the Davis. I will uh, make a promise going forward, uh, the at-large meetings will not conflict with another Ward meeting. That was just kind of an error tonight, but um, I, do, I do want to pass the microphone on. Thank you. I, I guess I have a couple of real special things I'd like to see done. First, I do think the opioid problem is a statewide problem, and it's going to require intervention by the state in terms of funding. Uh, there's an insufficient number of beds to treat people. I think that is really a, a, a big problem. I got a text message from someone I worked with a couple of years ago, and her brother, unfortunately, has fallen into a serious situation, and she didn't know where to turn, so I told her to call the uh, Men's, Addition, Men's Addiction Treatment Center down in Meadowbrook Road to see if she could get him a bed. Uh, we don't have enough treatment programs, and we need them. At the local level, I really believe, even though we won't reach everyone, we need education in the schools. 
we've really got to reach kids and I'm talking about, believe it or not, elementary level. I'm talking about third and fourth grade, where you start talking about these issues, where you start in a non-confrontational way educating kids about what's going on, what can happen, what's going to happen to you personally, what's going to happen to you legally, what's going to happen to you medically if you get involved with this stuff. And the last thing I would say is, well, not the next to last, I do favor treatment as opposed to incarceration not for someone who's pushing, but for somebody who perhaps has committed some crimes, even if they, you know, get picked up for shoplifting and they've got some heroin on them, defer the criminal case, let them get into a treatment program, give them that first proverbial bite of the apple to see if we can save them, if we can turn them around. Again, we're not going to have a hundred percent success rate, but I think we have to try. Throwing someone in jail probably to spend time with someone who's a drug dealer and can educate them on where they can get even more stuff is not the way to go. And also the police have a role to play. I enjoyed being out in the cruiser. I enjoyed getting out and talking to people. And I do think no matter how many police we have in the city, I want the police officers to have the best possible relationship with all of the different populations that live in the city. I don't think kids are going to run up and hug a cop. I mean, I just am not that naive. But I would hope someone might be able to say to an officer, I don't want to get involved, it didn't come from me, but this afternoon at such and such an intersection there's going to be a car from Quincy bringing in drugs. I'd like to have that kind of relationship where information is shared and the police can react and they can be proactive in terms of preventing some of these things going on instead of reacting and getting a search warrant and taking someone down. But education, additional treatment, state funding, uniform application of some strategies statewide because it's hitting every community. It's, it's a battle. It's not going to be solved overnight, but I think we are all committed to doing whatever we can here in Brockton. I know Michelle and her counterparts in the legislative delegation are, and I hope parents and school teachers and, and the rest will join us because it's, it's really very, very sad. It's, it's uh, you know, good people, uh, Good people can run afoul of this, and uh, we're going to do everything we can. Uh, you wanna, come on, this doesn't even affect me I don't have any kids in the school system, so you know that, Bob. So this has nothing to do with me, but we go back and forth, and so we say on the education, we go at the state level. I've been in politics forever, and on many levels, Washington down. So we we go on the level of Washington down, we say the state level legislation makes the rules, and then you say, now Brockton is getting a charter. So the kids now are going to be stuck with less funding. Brockton High has a great system. The kids, you know, the schools are going to be undercut for these teachers. They give their heart and soul to these kids that they work hard. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the public school for what they're, I mean, I don't even know how to say it. I see some of these teachers, I see the teachers over at the Brookfield that, I mean, they give everything they have. And these, I don't know, I just don't even know what I'm saying anymore. And then I see Governor Baker and they make these decisions that just, they put a charter school into Brockton and then Randolph and Taunton are just going to go into the lottery. Are they getting cut? Their funding? Are their money going to get taken from their schools? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, this is what I've been told. The lottery is going to come, but they're going to be charted in. They're going to come in. I mean, like, there's so many, like, you know what I mean? It doesn't even, you know, I just, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm asking anymore. And it doesn't even affect me. I, I, so then I, we go, it goes into too many, yeah. like, variables, but... I, I think you've expressed our frustration yeah, and Superintendent then you're, then Smith's... You're, you're like, then, you're, then you're asking, then you're saying, you're, you're talking, and then you get into, then we get into, we get into the drugs, then you get into taxes, then you, you don't have to worry about your taxes. Your money might as well, your taxes are going to go down because your houses aren't going to be worth anything anyway, so it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Doesn't matter. I mean, I own my own home. Doesn't matter. I can sell. I can move. Doesn't matter. I don't have kids in this system. But it's the point is, the legislation 
Yes, but it doesn't matter. Governor Baker, he just makes the decision. He dumped it on the city. Charters coming in. Regardless, you guys all fought for it. Didn't matter. Fought so, against it. Fought against, fought against it. it. Right. As I but said, say, Kelly, so in, it in doesn't matter. Virginia, right. I just think when, when I said Kathy Smith, our superintendent, would be here, she's here. Um, I think you right. should defer to her on this, if you don't mind, Kathy, and then we can all pipe in. Those are all valid. Thank you, Councilor. Yeah, and here I'm standing here fighting for something that doesn't affect me at all. You know what I could? But it affects your city that you live in. It affects my city. I've lived here my entire life. It affects the teachers that fight, fight tirelessly in day in, day out. Do you know what I mean? You know, I just, I look at it all. It's just a never ending thing. So you're going to undercut what people are working for, you know, the budgets and then what's going to get cut or the sports going to get cut. You So people want to have like a sports complex come in. I think that's a great thing. So the kids are playing in the middle school sports. Great. So that is an awesome thing. Kids should be able to play middle school sports. You know what I mean? I'm leaving to go to a, a game over in Bridgewater. They shouldn't be able to play. The kids in the city should be able to play. There's no reason for it. Do you know what I mean? You were talking about the drug induced, like the heroin, and I'm going to be dropping things off for the heroin. I mean, the homeless and the heroin. It just makes me mental. Yes, it starts in Washington and the legislator. I've been doing this my entire life. I just, it's just, but the point is, you can't fix one problem without another problem. But if this city keeps getting dumped, you know, Governor Baker, yes. The MBTA, you just can't keep doing one little problem, but you can't keep dumping on this city. We're not it. We can't just keep dumping. You Thank can't you. keep dumping. And I'm sorry, that's, I don't know. Just, yeah, it's my city, but. Thank you, very heartfelt. Thank you, and I think uh, Superintendent Smith can address some of those issues. Thank you, counselors. Um, is, use the microphone. Is the that microphone is just for the filming. It's okay. not really for the people okay. in the audience. But. Uh, first of all, uh, it's interesting, and Kelly, I, I share your frustration. I thank you for coming in support of your teachers, of your schools, and there's so many of you out there that are doing exactly that. This was a very, very frustrating time, but interesting enough, I will have to tell you this. With everything that we're dealing with, whether it's difficult budgets that are ahead for not just Brockton, many cities, many towns, I actually feel very good about the support we have district-wide with our legislative group, our city council, our school committee. It is going to be difficult, and we are going to have to make difficult decisions. But make no mistake about it. We are out there already looking at meeting with state government. I'm connecting with other superintendents to talk about ways that we get to not just our legislators who are on board, but senators and legislators, House of, House of Ways and Means, uh, many of these different groups that we will be advocating. And we also are going to start to look for advocacy from each of you. We're already talking in the schools to get point people to start to educate parents. We're going to be having uh, actually a campaign called Brockton Kids Count. So we're going to be looking for help from many of you out there. So to address the situation on the charter school, you know, I have to tell you, I'm not completely against charters. They actually have a purpose. And when you look back at the uh, Ed Reform Bill that came in in 1993 because of your very city that actually had the uh, McDuffie case, so you brought about change. There was equity in education because of you going forward as a community saying enough is enough, this funding isn't the way it should be, and we need a different formula. So that being said, at the time, there was a lot of push around the country for vouchers and charters. And they actually put in the bill that 25 charters could come into our state. And those charters were to have best practices, things that we could actually learn from a charter. There might have been some autonomies from a contract. Maybe there was dealing with some difficult populations where there were extra hours, summer programs, uh, different ways of reaching kids. But that isn't where we're at today. And shame on us for letting this happen. And do not kid yourself, this is very, very political. So when you look at this charter that came in, my first question is, what's innovative about it? 
What are we going to learn as a district from this charter that you're proposing for the, for the district or the city of Brockton? And I don't have enough time to go into why Taunton is involved or Randolph is involved. But in the end, um, we certainly uh, had a rebuttal uh, against this charter, which is supposed to be to support children going to college. Well, let me tell you, it was a proud moment when I stood there on Tuesday during the hearing of visitors with all your legislative group. And it was interesting to hear the Commissioner of Ed, before the meeting started, tell the Board of Education that he had really good news for them. That around the state, there was an increase in the number of kids taking AP classes or raising their SAT scores for underrepresented communities, uh, minority communities. And I loved it because when I got to talk, I got to look at that Board of Education and say, thank you, Commissioner, because Brockton was one of 13 around the state just given that award a week ago, that you have raised your number of students going into AP classes, and you've raised the SAT scores, and you continue to send kids to college. You know, do we make it for every kid? We try. We have pathways if, if Brockton High is not the answer. Parents have lots of choice. So make no mistake about it, this was voted in along political lines. Not because of advocacy, not because of need, not because of demand, but the bottom line as superintendent is I do have to care about the education of every child in this city. And that includes children. We collaborate with uh, parochial and private schools if we can help in the areas of safety and security. We collaborate in many ways and have excellent collegial relationships. I will watch this charter. This is very, very difficult. I will be a watchdog for it. I will make sure that the spending, we will take a look at if our children are being educated, what about our special needs students? Our large population of English language learners. Are those children gonna be coming back to the public schools after October 1st, which is the date that you count kids for your foundation formula, and that's important to us as a city. So make no mistake about it, we're not going away. We will continue to watch the education of every one of your children and any child, again, that goes to the Charter or the Brockton Public Schools. So please know we are there to, to continue to watch this. Thank you, Superintendent. And I, and I would say to the young lady in the back, if you can't beat them politically, sometimes you can beat them in court. We did it before. We did it with, it started off Webby versus Dukakis and then it became McDuffie versus Dukakis. And if necessary, and I've exchanged some emails with the superintendent, I'm not opposed to seeing this city be at the forefront again of a legal challenge because this time we have a lot of other districts who have been adversely affected as we do. So I suspect we'll be leading a charge with a lot of backup. Yeah, I mean, what, what Wynn said, it was, it was Robin, Robin Webby, and then it was the Hancock case and the McDuffie case. So there's been three plaintiffs uh, coming from the city of Brockton to change that. We've talked about this collectively in the past. Um, I, I do envision uh, that, you know, we're getting shafted. I'll put the cards on the table. Brockton's getting shafted. We're not getting treated fairly and at the detriment of our, of our youth. So um, we do have, um, you know, a really passionate superintendent that we work really, really well with. Um, previous superintendents uh, wouldn't come before the city council other than the budget. Uh, Kathy Smith comes at the beck and call. Anytime we want her, she comes there. Um, tonight's meeting here at North, I contacted her office and like that it was set up. So I mean, it's a it's really good partnership, um, you know, that we have with the school department. And that's the way it should be. You know, we're all in this together. Um, and with that being said, um, are there any other questions on that? And thank you very much, Kelly Hanlon, for that question. Anybody else, please, please come up. Jean Lawton. Good evening, Gene. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, very proud that you enabled us to come and speak today. Um, in regards to the charter school, I was I had two questions, if I could. One, if uh, Superintendent Smith could expound upon the financial uh, liabilities of what she was just saying about the October 1st count or the students coming back. And also, if the city council <clears throat> has any uh, influence on where, where the physical location of the charter school would be. Uh, my concern is for either the proposed site of the Massasoit 
uh, the old Christos or the Ganley building, if it could come in on either one of them, since they're under the control of the state. Thank you. I, I, yeah, let me let me address the location. First of all, the city council would have absolutely no uh, input whatsoever. Uh, they can place it anywhere. The the two properties you talked about, Gene, um, I filed the resolve last legislative session, um, and it was supported 100 percent by my colleagues because, in good faith, we sold the Ganley building. If anybody isn't aware of the Ganley building, go down Belmont Street, right to get to Main Street. The building in front of you is the Ganley building. Joe Ganley had a store there for for many, many, many years. The city owned it, and we were told by then Governor Deval Patrick, "Hey, convey it over, sell it to us for a buck. It will become a property and asset of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And in return, we're going to put a college collaborative down there. It's going to be." really really revitalizing downtown well that sounded great we did it um, maybe we jumped the gun but we relied in good faith on what we were told uh, Devel Patrick doesn't run again because he can't uh, Charlie Baker comes in and he cuts the funding um, you know the same thing with the old Christos restaurant you know there's a Connors family uh, icons in the city of Brockton they they got paid a dollar amount from the Commonwealth now it's, it looks like a skateboarding park over there it's just an empty parking lot what I will say Gene addressing the Ganley building is myself and my colleagues in the City Council uh, have agreed again to file a resolve because under the last legislative session we uh, we made a promise to uh, to Mayor Cobb that we would hold off a bit because he was working with DCAM and Governor Baker and Karen Polito, Lieutenant Governor, to see if it would come to fruition. Uh, we're not naive. It's not coming to fruition. The College Collaborative is not coming downtown in the near future. That money's gone, though. So uh, we will be collectively filing a resolve again, urging. We can't force, but we're going to urge that the mayor speak to his uh, colleagues at the State House. And I know Michelle Dubois and Mike Brady and Claire Cronin and Jerry Cassidy, who gets in there, are going to be supporting us as well. We, we want that back if and when the budget gets reallotted the city brock and the college collaborative will become a reality we can sell it back again for a buck but we would rather own that asset as a city of brockton asset so that a charter school doesn't go downtown in the city of brockton thank you thank you uh, gene to answer your question about uh the october 1st date that i mentioned under Chapter 70 funding, and again, you know, we're a large urban gateway district, we rely heavily on state funding with the formula. Almost 80% of our funding comes from the state. When I talk about October 1st, on that date, and this is for districts throughout the Commonwealth, it's charters, it's public schools, anybody that receives, you know, public money. So on that date, we have a head count throughout our school, from the little kindergartners that are sitting there to some of our special needs preschoolers, all the way up to our 12th graders. We give a count to the state that goes along with a student ID number. That number is solid as far as when they go through the formula to give us a per pupil expenditure for that money. That what, that's what comes into the district. Now what happens after October 1st Sometimes in a district as large as ours, we could have anywhere from 100 kids, 200 kids that from October to the end of the year come in. We have to find seat capacity for them, you know, classrooms for them to go to. There's, there's nobody to turn away. Children that are homeless, you know, large numbers of kids come into our district. When I made the comment about the charters, if you look at this charter, their business plan by October 1st accounts for 315 students that they're going to have or want to have their first year. My concern is many times charter schools sell a bill of goods. They're going to do all kinds of things for, for students. So if they have 315 on October 1st, that's the funding that they get in that next cycle. And what happens many times is you end up with children getting disillusioned, families get disillusioned, for whatever reason, they end up back in the public schools. So one of the things I've shared with the commissioner and his group is I will be watching that very closely. With a very tough budget year, we do not have that capacity. It's not that we have to educate every child that comes through those doors. So that's important to us, that October 1st date. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. Yep. Okay. Anybody else want to? Talk about. Any other questions? Mr. Ford. And I do want to acknowledge Bill Healy, Officer Bill Healy from Brockton PD has shown up. I told you he was coming, he had another meeting. And, and before we conclude tonight, Bill can give us an update on public safety if there's any, anything. Mr. Ford. Uh, hi, my name is Robert Ford. I live at 61 Monty Street. And myself, like many other residents, probably witnessed the largest tax increase in the city's history. And uh, 
you know, I realize that, you know, the, the government needs money to, you know, to run on, but, uh, you know, you get to a point where I, I, enough is enough, you know, and, uh, you know, and uh, the, the basic thing is maybe to cut, cut out the waste and spending. I mean, we're, we're dumping six and a half million dollars a year for that money pit in Dayton, something we don't even use. Uh, there's another large sum of money being funded through the 21st Century Corp. To, to float the, uh, you know, the Shaw Center and the, and the rocks. Between those two entities, there's $8 million that the city's blowing. You know, that, that could do a lot of good. It could put a couple of police officers on the street, fix, you know, fix some of the, you know, the, the deteriorating streets in the city. And uh, the thing that's really frustrating is I, I got a hold of a list of some well-connected individuals that have these massive tax abatements. And uh, these people are either millionaires, billionaires, or well on the way to becoming one. And just a small list, there's $317,000 worth of abatements. And, and these are, these are well-known folks, you know, influential people in the city. And, uh, you know, God help you if you're, if you're a resident and you try to get a couple of bucks knocked out of your taxes. But, uh, you know, this whole process starts in June. A lot of people don't, wait, don't realize that when they have the the mayor's budget, I put that in quotation marks. <laughs> we all know whose budget it really is. But, uh, you know, there's, there's ways of trimming it down. In fact, a couple of years ago, we had a large contingent of angry residents come up and uh, actually uh, the CFO miraculously found $2 million. You know, I guess he's got the ability to pull stuff out of thin air at times. But, uh, you know, it would help to keep the tax rate down. But, uh, you know, this is, I'm just voice those my frustration and probably the frustrations of many other residents. That when, well, in June, you, you, you have the option of trimming that budget a little bit. In fact, we've suggested on several occasions to have an outside auditor of the city's books, to open up the books and see how much money the city actually has. I mean, there's... Yeah. No, he, he, he was asking a question about setting the tax rate and the fact that his taxes went up pretty significantly because property values did go up in Brockton and he mentioned he has some information. I've, I've received a copy of it about some potential savings in the city. A, a couple of things with respect to the tax rate. I think you're going to see this council next year when the information comes into us about uh, the levy and, and the amount of taxes to be raised, which is 2.5% over the prior year's levy, I think you're going to see a very proactive group of people really drill down on the numbers that are presented and take a look at how those, those yeah. taxes are apportioned between residential and business. And the other thing that I'm interested in is I'd like to find out why we have to set the tax rate in December. I haven't even asked my colleagues that, but it seems like we wait till the next to the last meeting in December, we set the tax rate, and then the tax increase is compressed into the last two quarterly payments. So let's say you only get a, only I should say, let's say you get a $500 increase. Unfortunately, you don't have four quarters to pay that, 125 a quarter. It's compressed into your last two quarters. And I, I'm really unsure why if we, if we adopt the fiscal year budget and we send the information to the state, why we can't have a hearing earlier and set the tax rate and perhaps get the information out so that we don't compress it into the last two quarters, maybe only the last three quarters. And, and I'm not sure. I haven't been with my colleagues well, the enough. The city but. council also has the option of lowering the factor a little bit to ease the burden. Well, you're right. You, we do have that option, but unfortunately in this city the, the complexity of the issues in terms of public safety, school funding, and some of the statutory functions that we have to carry out, such as collect taxes, issue building permits, we're, we're really down to, and, I, and I've taken a careful look at it, believe me, I would, I would be the first to raise a red flag. We're really down to bare bones. If you look at the budget, we've got a lot of vacant positions on the city side because we simply don't have the money to yeah. fill them. But even if they walk away from some of the bad deals they've made over, over the past several years. Well, you know, it, hindsight is always 2020 yeah. vision, and I know all of us share uh, profound frustration over some of the decisions that were made years and years ago. And, you know, the, well, as far the, as the, the, the Aquarius uh, situation is there's 13 percent that nobody knows who they are. They're local investors or the people that are. 
Yeah, I mean, so Mr. Ford's talking about Aquaria, and, and, and everybody has either read about it or heard about it. Um, the city council, I actually, I, I'll take credit because I did this. I filed a resolve six years ago to have Aquaria come before the city council, explain to us how they are abiding by the contract, six years ago, mind you, how they are abiding by the contract vis-a-vis -vis marketing. Who are they marketing to? They have one customer, the city of Brockton. Uh, fast forward, they came in once. This individual had absolutely no information whatsoever, okay? So it died because there was a new legislative session two years later. I filed a thing again four years ago. I get the same guy that comes before us that absolutely has no clue. He's disgusted that we asked him to come before us. Again, we can only invite people. We don't have a, a, a subpoena power. Uh, but again, ill-prepared. And this guy is supposed to be an agent for a business partner with the city of Brockton getting paid millions and millions of dollars. Two years ago, I filed the thing again. And this time, a new guy came before us with his attorney and said, I'm so sorry, I don't have any information, but I'll get back to you. So, you know, I got my Irish up and we got it going. And uh, what happened was, uh, to the credit of Council Rodriguez and supported by Shana and everybody on the council at that time, we cut the funding. And you know what? He showed up the next time and he had some information. Um, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be like that. Now, ultimately, uh, you know, as a lawyer, I understand how contracts work. You sign a contract, if you don't do something, you're going to be sued for breach, right? We got to the point where they threatened to breach us and bring us to court, um, but they also gave us the information. It was three binders, each this size. Um, you know, I would have to say, uh, the frustration level on the city council uh, was magnified uh, and mag really magnified because of the fact that this is what they told us, ladies and gentlemen. They told us that they didn't come before us to give us the information because they were working on a negotiation with the current mayor, potentially Brockton would buy this thing, okay? And what I said to them was, with all due respect, the previous mayors, Mayor Belzotti, Mayor Harrington, weren't negotiating with you to buy it, and you still didn't give us the information. So what you're saying just doesn't make any common sense or rational sense. So um, I concur with you, uh, Mr. Ford. I mean, we're, we're dealing with a lot. Um, the abatement issues you're talking about, city council doesn't have anything to do with abatements. Um, nope. Anybody can request abatement under Mass General Law, as you know. It's time sensitive. I would urge people that if they feel that they should, you should definitely do it. Um, in terms of you saying certain people got it, I, you know, I, we, don't, we don't have anything about that information, meaning we can't decide who gets it and who doesn't, yep. but that's interesting. Yep. Yep. Um, Moses, do you have anything to offer well, on any of those? One thing, uh, Bob, uh, 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 the other day in the newspaper, you see the city of Taunton, they said thanks, but no thanks to Aquaria when they saw the, you know, the price of the water. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, yep. Brockton's the only customer. Yep. That's it. All right. <coughs> well, um, uh, as Councilor Sullivan said, you know, um, the, your, one of the things that uh, I think goes by the sometimes the, uh, the by the side in the city is actually to the fact that none of us are really professional city councilors, and I don't mean that we don't do our jobs professionally. I mean that we are not full-time city councilors or paid a full-time salary which means that we all have our secondary job or our primary jobs in some cases to provide for our families, which also makes us taxpayers. You know, we pay, when your taxes went up, my taxes went up. I have a, uh, another home where my daughter lives on, uh, on Tribu Street on the south side of the city. My taxes in that little house went up 600 bucks from what I paid the previous year. So. Our taxes are going up as well, too. So the frustration that you feel are frustrations that I'm feeling and all my colleagues are feeling because our taxes are also going up. Our expenses are also going up. And our city looks lousy in the sense, in the eyes of a lot, because of the crime issues, because of the drug issues that we have. I know that, and I think I said this during the, uh, the campaign, and I'm glad Council Farwell brought that up, that we can't lock... Or, or jail our way out of the problems that we have in this community. We cannot incarcerate, incarcerate our way out of the problems that we're facing in this city. So we have to invest in a lot more education because that I, that I know of, I'm no doctor, but no person is born addicted to anything. 
You're born addicted. If your mother's already addicted, you might have an addiction. But from ground zero, if there's no addiction, no one's ever been addicted in your family, or you're not addicted in your family, you're not born addicted to anything. Somehow, you pick that up as you go along. And I think that's why, that's why it's important for us to invest on education, to teach young people to stay away from a lot of the real bad drugs that are taking place in our community. Because what ends up happening is like we have a little boat with holes all over it and we're just bailing the water out we just keep bailing the water out without fixing the boat we need to fix the problem which is the boat because no matter how quickly you bail it out it's going to come back in again and unfortunately that's what's that's actually what's happening with the with the issues of, of drugs and violence in our community we're not really fixing the problem we're putting a band-aid and the men and women in the police department they do a wonderful job in fighting crime or resolving crime once it happens but we got to spend a great deal of more time and effort in preventing crime from happening because they solve the problems i mean they solve the crime once it happens but we're not spending a great deal of time working on prevention i'm glad that the uh you know that we're looking into the sports complex you know to bring it to the community to help our community out because it gives our kids another avenue another thing to do in the community but we we as a community, we need to start, we have to go back to basics and work on basic stuff to help our kids and help our communities stay, one, off the drugs that are becoming very addicted for them in the community, and also at the same time, try to do what we can to help young people from getting involved in the activities, in the illegal activities or, or crime-related activities that they're involved in. Because arresting our way out of it it's not going to work because we put one away another one takes their place you know we put two away two will take their place so by just arresting our way out of it i don't think it's a it's a solution to anything because you know what if it was a solution it would have been taken care of by now and it's not being taken care of because that's not the answer to both the the drugs and the violence that we have in our streets And I don't want to prolong this particular question or this particular set of issues, but um, I just want to re reiterate, you know, we're here as elected officials, yes, but like Councillor Rodriguez said, we're also citizens, we're also residents with concerns and with, with fears and issues and, and everything else that you all have as well. So this is a partnership. We're, we're all in this together. We're, we're in that same holy boat you know, all bailing the water out together. So we, we have to also continue to move in a forward, uh, with forward momentum. And I, I just want to say too, he mentioned the Band-Aid issue and that's, I was thinking that. Um, people have been coming with, with the, the pending budget issues and you know, with the release of the budget and the, um, the devastation, I'm just gonna say the devastation that we, we look to with that. I just want to caution everyone too, to not, um, T don't support knee-jerk kind of solutions, and I use my quote fingers. Um, a lot of people are kind of running around, well, well then we have, to, we have to agree to this, we have to agree to that, we have to do this, we have to do that, because we need the money, we need the money. We have to take a breath and take a beat and make sure that we don't get involved in these other Band-Aid solutions that when, what happens with a Band-Aid when, it when it's not um, applied appropriately, it gets fuzzy and it falls off, then you still have a problem, right? So I think that's how we got into a lot of these problems as we ha that we have now, and like Councilor Fowles said, the profound frustration that we all have about things that happened when none of us were on this council. Um, so those are the things that we don't want to pass down going forward as well. So we have to make sure that we look with eyes wide open um, at the things that, that we're presented with. Not every idea is a good idea. And we need to use our critical thinking skills and we need to, again, work together um, and not kind of be a, a, a divisive kind of ish, um, uh, city. Um, and we have to do that. I just want to encourage everybody to do that. We're all partners in this. Nobody is, is doing this alone. It's not a one, one man, one woman, one person show. We're all partners. Thank you, Shana. Uh, I do want to acknowledge um, R Rob May, the city planner is here. Uh, Steve Hook, I mentioned earlier, he's director of Brockton uh, Emergency Management. And thank you for what you did with the storms recently, you and your staff. Uh, Archie Gormley, a Brockton firefighter, uh, but he's also president of the Union 144. Thank you for being here, Archie. And of course, Bill Healy. Um, and again, the, the men and women that serve on Brockton PD and Brockton Fire, they put their lives on the line. And, uh, and we have a, a, a great city with some dedicated public servants. Bill, would you like to come up and and I know when, when Bill comes to these forums, he goes to every single, uh, every single ward, 
counselors meeting. Um, but he has to be cautious on what he says relative to police actions and endeavors and planning. So with that being said, thanks for being here, Bill. Thanks, counselors, uh, for inviting me. And uh, like the counselor just said, there's only so much you can say when we're on TV here. Um, so I'm going to keep it brief. Uh, my name's Bill Healy. I've been doing the Neighborhood Watch now for the past six years. Most of you know that. I know a lot, many faces from the other uh, wards throughout the city. I have a theme that, I'm gonna, that I've, I've been doing since the beginning of this year. I'm going to continue through the rest of this year. And that is, you've heard the councilors talk about how hard we work. Now it's time that the citizens start reaching out to us by way of the tip line. You read the paper every single day. Every day, the Brockton Police Department, they're making an arrest, drugs and or gun related. And if you read the paper and you notice that every single week you'll see that, most of this derives from tips. Most of it does. Like uh, Council Rodriguez says, we solve the crime after it happens on almost all occasions. Again, a lot of the reasons why the crime is solved is through anonymous tips. Uh, last December, a couple of weeks before Christmas, in a complex located in Ward 7 here, big ward meeting, just as many people as here, maybe, maybe slightly less, there was a grandmother that resides there with her grandson, and places were being broken into. Christmas gifts were being stolen. In there was the grandmother, the grandson who the police already had on the radar and we were about to arrest, she stands up with a crowd like this and says, snitches get stitches. A low-life human being, to be honest with you. Here's people like this, all of the community, and by the way, I live here too, I have for 32 years. Get out of, the, get out of our meeting. It was unbelievable, and the people there, some of them intimidated, had already given the anonymous tips, right? Two days later, this person was arrested, what became of it, whether or not he got bailed, how long he served. We all know the deal. I don't know. I don't follow up on it. So from that point, and I figured after you know, going through the course of 2015, I said, 2016, I've got to do something here. We're going to start really being passionate about people calling with tips anonymously. Don't be afraid. And all you have to do, you don't have to write anything down. Everybody in here is on the Internet. Brockton Police Department website, Neighborhood Business Watch, click on to that, drop down screen will come for tips. I don't even know who it is that's calling. And by the way, my program is such, a superior court judge could not force me to give the courts the information as to who gave me a tip. Can't do it. But if you don't believe that, it doesn't matter. If you go on to that tip line and give the tips, very simple, it's just a matter of typing in information. All I see is a number, not your name, not anything. That tip is printed, and over the course of a week, several times during the week, these tips go to the chief of police. The chief of police delegates the assignment. Drug issue, off to narcotics, et cetera, et cetera. So, plead with you all. The counselors have talked about it in the past. The mayor talks about it. We've got all sorts of communication avenues do this, help yourselves, send in the tips, and we follow up on them. And every time I have a meeting like this, there'll be 10 tips tomorrow. <laughs> it's just, so do it. Don't be intimidated about it. And uh, you'll also, for those that don't have a computer, 508-941-0200. Uh, I gotta actually double check. <laughs> because I don't, I don't call myself. But, uh, and, and, and I've been, in this past year, because I saw the reporters writing this number down, it's important. <laughs> yeah, 508 941, did I say it? 0244. Those without, those without a computer, those that don't feel comfortable going online, that phone number, you can leave the tip there. I take the information, type it in, which I prefer you would do. I type it in, off it goes to the chief. That's simple. That's going to be the theme. So those of you that follow us around at the counselors, you're going to hear it again and again. And hopefully, during the course of the year, more tips, more people caught. And I'll take, I'm going to be here as long as they are longer. You can meet me if you have something to discuss in private. 
or if you have any questions right now, law enforcement wise, uh, I can answer any questions. questions for Officer Healy? Thank you, Bill. There you go. I do also want to recognize uh, State Representative Claire Cronin's here. Thank you for joining us tonight, Claire. And, um, and Senator Mike Brady's A. Jean is here as well. Thanks for being here. Um, Bill Healy, like I said, he, he does yeoman's work. He goes to every single community meeting and take a bump on, on his offer. I mean, he wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. I mean, he cares about Brockton. Yeah, it's, it's a paid job, but he really takes it to heart. So by all means, if you want to reach out to him uh, in private, feel free. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, Ma'am, do you have a question? Okay. There hasn't been any discussion. Kathy, do you want to? Thank you for your question, ma'am. Thank you, Glenna. Like many of the background checks going on, certainly all over the country, businesses, certainly schools, one of the things that came about um, just this past, I have to think of my years, uh, July, I believe, of 14. And there was increments as to how long it would take to get everybody fingerprinted. I think it was actually done by last names. So in the Brockton Public Schools, it is required that all teachers, professional staff must be fingerprinted. Uh, I believe the date coming up to finalize that is this July, and it is a cost of $55. And so, simply, uh, teachers also have costs when they have to renew their license. This is one of those costs associated with having a valid teacher's license to teach in the state of Massachusetts and frankly all over the country. As far as anyone that is not a certified staff member, it is a cost of $35. That would be paraprofessionals, administrative assistants, MTAs, uh, all of the people that make up the Brockton Public Schools. Our college students, uh, no matter who it is, people that work in our extended day programs, all have to be fingerprinted. That's along with a quarry that has always been required. So again, these are background checks that they do on our employees to make sure that they are able to work with children uh, in a school system. Also, they should know who is applying this. The police department has nothing to do with this, right? We work with the police department in processing the quarries, and they assist us. But the fingerprinting is a national database. I believe there are centers set up. I know there's one next to the Starbucks here. Uh, and it is a governmental, I want to say it's an identi... Is it the show? I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize, but... Independent kind of agency that, that perform the um, fingerprint checks all over the state. Right. I'm, yeah. If you go there, they actually check people that are getting passports or... Jobs. Also, yeah. I heard that, uh, and I've checked other places that have done this, okay? It's $55 for <laughs> one money, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Yeah, well, a state mandate is also a teacher's license, and they give us nothing to renew our license. So I don't know the answer to that, Glenna, but I do know that there are other state mandates that we have to follow for licensure, and there is no money coming from the way of the state. So at this point here, it is $55. It is borne by the employee. It is a one-time fingerprinting. I think it covers you for 10 years, and you're able to actually send it uh, to other districts. So if a teacher were to leave Brockton and go to Raynham to teach, we could share that information as long as it was within that 10-year period. It's certainly not going to the Brockton Public Schools. It goes to the agencies that are processing it. Yeah. I'm not really sure about this particular agency, but I do know that there are several agencies that I work with um, in my, my day job, my, my bill payer job. Um, the fees that they collect for processing things, petitions, fingerprints, all of these things that they do, it's it covers the cost of the processing. So it kind of it's like a like a circ a, cyclic, a cyclical 
kind of process. So I'm not sure about this one, but it sounds like this particular agency, they may use the fee to continue to be able to fingerprint and, and to, to process um, the cases. So it might be something like that. You think the school committee should be uh, a little bit more involved in it, not um, check it out? I'm not sure, Glenna, what you mean, the school committee. Um, you know, they, the, I'd like to be able to call my school committee person and log to say, and to say, what is this about? They know. They certainly do know. The fingerprinting, again, is, is uh, something that is used for a teacher to gain employment, and what it does is it gives confidence to every one of you out there, to parents, to community members, knowing that the people sitting in front of your children or working with your children are able to be there, do not have criminal backgrounds. You know, they're not the kind of people that you wouldn't want in front of your children. So I do believe that we support any measure that allows us to have a comfort to make sure our children are safe. Very good. And I also just have one more. I, I have a lot, but I'll just the, All the programs are taken out of elementary schools. Is there any way we can get some of them back in? And one in particular is Stranger Danger. I can't believe okay. that you know, we're, we're looking for safety in our city. And uh, we, we take out yeah, we, we, programs that are only... Yeah, we certainly don't take programs out. We are very inclusive. Many times the programs come with grant funding, which is very helpful to a district struggling to put books in front of children and technology and all of the things they need. I know right now we have a great program. We actually have our, our Brockton school police officers working in our fifth grade classes, our sixth and seventh grade classes throughout the district. Um, we have a number of collaborations with different agencies, nonprofits. So, Glenna, any time a grant comes through, our grant writer is on it. Today, there was actually just a, a $300,000 grant with BayWib uh, for working with kids for, I, I know Representative Cronin was there today. Uh, this was given throughout the state. So, I mean, we're, we're out in front of whatever program is there. We work collaboratively with nonprofits, with any districts, um, any other school districts, so we continue to do that. We have seen a drop because of grants in after-school programs, uh, academic support, uh, summer programs, but we continue to be out there looking to make sure we have things for these children to be involved in. There was. I'm sorry, the, the charter school uh, vote, um, what I said earlier when I stood here, um, this very much was a community effort. Uh, I talked about truly looking at how charters came about many, many years ago. And a lot of it was sharing best practices, um, you know, being able to do something that we, the public school, couldn't do. This very much was not this application. I was proud to stand alongside your full legislative contingent uh, on Tuesday. I know our city council certainly supported us, our full school committee. That came across loud and clear before the hearing of visitors. I felt it was very much along political lines. What I also said was, although this group is coming in, we would be a watchdog. We would make sure that if our children are promised something, we will make sure that that's what is delivered to our children in the Brockton community. And I'm happy to talk to you about it, certainly, Glenner, at another time. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, Sen Senator Brady sends his regards. I, I forgot to mention this earlier. He, he's at a meeting at the State House with the Senate President. Um, any other questions? Because there's, there's, one, there's one elephant on the table that wasn't brought up tonight, and I'm going to do it cursory, the power plant. I just want people to understand, um, because I've gotten a lot of calls, I know my colleagues have, in terms of what happened at the federal level, and I could talk about that. So from a legal positioning, legal jockeying standpoint, what the plaintiff did was drop certain defendants, okay? Took them out of the lawsuit. City Council was dropped as a defendant in the lawsuit. So I'm not being sued, Shana's not being sued, when or Moses. But, but that doesn't mean a lot of people perceive that as the city council now supporting the power plant or we packed it in and it's going to happen. Um, that's not, not true. The second thing from the federal level is that the consent decree that Judge Sorkin has ratified really says two things in it. It's a very wordy document. What it says is 
the city council or any boards have to act lawful, which we always do, and cannot discriminate against a proponent or an applicant. That's what it says. What I will say is this. If you look at the online version of the, of the Brockton Enterprise tonight, you'll see the city council has sued Mayor Carpenter. It's on tonight's website. You'll see it. We filed an action in Superior Court in Plymouth County. Um, so I think that speaks volume for itself. We're not, as, as an elected officials, we're not going to talk about legal jockeying or positioning, but I just want to make it clear on behalf of myself and the, my colleagues, because a lot of people have called us saying, you guys just you support it now, you sell out. That is 100% far from reality or far from the truth. So what I will say again, having served for 11 years on the city council, this issue has been for 10 years. I will say that the city council does not act irrationally, especially when you're talking about suing a mayor. Okay, and that has happened, and that's go going on right now. You can read about it in tomorrow's paper if you choose to, or you could call us one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we can't talk about it collectively. But I, again, that didn't come up tonight, but I thought before we conclude tonight, you needed to be aware of that. Is there anything else that you want to talk about tonight to any of the at-large? No? Well, first of all, on behalf of Shana, Wynn, Moses, and myself, I want to thank you. We go to a lot of ward meetings. This is a well-attended meeting. So kudos to you. Again, it's citywide. We will have another one. Um, we will have three more. This is the first of four. Uh, a, a, really a location to be determined, but it's either going to be West, South, or East Middle School. And we're going to continue uh, to do this because we work with you, and more importantly, we work for you. Thank you all tonight. Thank you.